Okay, we're here with uh, Mr. John Young from Barto, Florida, in, in our legacy project as we continue. And John, uh, why did you decide to be a band director and what were the circumstances that began your band journey? Well, it all started with my high school band director. And it was a unique situation. He, he, his main job was in the next town where he taught half a day and in the afternoons he'd go out to different towns uh, one day a week. And he came to our town when I was in the seventh grade and he said, I want to start a band here. And got some parents, had a meeting, and grades seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 were all beginners at the same time. And he put together uh, about a 45 piece uh, group. Uh, and as the years went on, of course the, the more uh, advanced the older students, juniors and seniors, for example, learn faster than some of us seventh graders did, and they would help us. And as time went on, uh, when I got to be a junior and senior, why I, I was asked to work with other students to bring them along. It's, you can just see how that would develop through the years. And I ended up in charge of the basketball pet band. There was no football in this small school, but basketball was big. And uh, I really enjoyed it. The thing I would say is I had a very good uh, band experience in grades 7 through 12. It was just delightful and enjoyable. Now, where was, where was this? This was Pentwater, Michigan, right on Lake Michigan. And uh, a, a town of about 1,500 ordinarily. In the summer, it would swell to 15,000 because it was a summer resort area also right on Lake Michigan. And uh, as the time went on, I, right out of high school, I went into the Army. And when I got out of the Army at about age 20, I returned to the uh, hometown and joined the family business of commercial fishing on Lake Michigan. And at that, same, at that time, I would go out on the tug. It was a one, uh, out in the morning, back in the afternoon, work with the fish and nets, and, work, and you're done at dark six days a week, but on Saturday nights, I, I joined uh, the Roger Dance's dance band. Roger, as it turned out, ended up, we ended up as roommates at Stetson for a number of three years, and uh, he went on to be the band director of the University of Georgia for 36 years. We were both trumpet players. We lived in different towns, but had the same band director who was in, in now, this, how far how far would this band director travel? You, you know, it's, it's you know nowadays band directors will go from school to school, but town to town, town to town, and not only that. At one of our recent concerts with the Bartow Dell Concert Band, a uh, guy came up to me and he said afterwards, he said, um, "Who is your band director?" And I said, "Louis F. Peterson." He said, "Me too." I said, "Where did, where were you?" Northport which was probably 70 or 80 miles north of the town that Louis lived in. And he, all up and down, all up and down Western Michigan, Louis started bands in different places. Anyway, that's where it started. But, uh, so the dance band, that was a big thing when I got out of the service on Saturday nights. It was a roller skating rink, but on Saturday nights it was dance. It was a swing era. And it was the big band era, and Harry James was our idol. He was something else. And as trumpet players, we really enjoyed this. It turned out that uh, the replacement band director for Louis Peterson at Ludington, Michigan, uh, had already been selected in the summer of 1947 because Louis was retiring then. And uh, Louis died two months after retirement on the golf course, his last words were, hey guys, wait for me, and he dropped. But Louis, before that time, the, the year and a half that, that I was home after the Army, Louis helped a group in town. There were many veterans returning from the service, various branches of services at, at this time, and, and Louis showed us how to form a band. The Pentwater Civic Band is what they ended up calling it. It started in the spring of 1947, and the purpose was summer band concerts in the park at, from 8 to 9 o'clock every 
Thursday night between Flag Day and Labor Day. And it was, bring your horn and come on down and play, mostly marches and waltzes and the little pop tunes and march size music. And that is still going on today, 67 years later. And uh, so I ended up, well, the first director of that Pentwater Civic Band was an old, uh, an old uh, circus trombone player. And he knew what needed to be done, but at the first uh, several rehearsals, four or five rehearsals that we had in the spring of 1947, he showed up drunker and stone. <laughs> and so it didn't take long that he was no longer uh, the band director. And they said, John, you call the tunes and we'll use a roll off on these marches and away we go. And I did that for about four summers, I guess. So this was when you were in high school or you were in college? No, neither. I was working on the fish tower. Oh, you were still working? For a year and a half. Okay. And, uh, but at the end of, let's see, we started in 1947, so 47, 48 was going. By spring of 1948, I'd made up my mind. I enjoyed the music so much, and uh, I wasn't ready to settle down. If I would have been, I'd ended up being a fisherman up there for the rest of my life, but I wasn't ready. I'd traveled a good bit in the Army, and uh, I was not ready. And But Bob McKember, the replacement for Louis Peterson, played first alto in, in Roger Dance's dance band, and he said, you and Roger ought to go to Florida, to Stetson University. That one of my classmates, I graduated there, one of my classmates is now the band director, Dick Fiesel, and he's putting a band together, and you guys would really enjoy it. I'd always wanted to go to Florida, never been to Florida. This was my chance, I went. I thought I'll go for a year and see how it goes. And I stayed in Florida, and then it gets to the next part of why I chose this profession. Uh, there was still a little iffy halfway through the uh, my so even while you were at Stetson studying music, you weren't quite sure yet? No. I thought it was the thing I wanted to do. That's what I went there to learn. But halfway, And that's what I uh, intended to do. Um, halfway through my college years, my dad called and said, I'll offer the business to you or your brother or both of you. My brother and I had a long talk. He was in engineering in California, and I was in education in Florida, and we had a long talk and decided it'd be nice, but we're going to go the directions we're headed. So that was a very important decision time right there. Right. My decision was to get that degree and then see what. Uh, Don Yaxley, my brass instructor at Stetson, took a bunch of us to uh, the state contest, no, first FMEA in 1950, while we were still students. You got to meet all kinds of band directors. The Florida Band Masters uh, meeting that year was very informative. And there's, they only had a, a one or two meetings at the most uh, a year. And then in the spring, he took us to Miami in 1950 to the state contest, and where we heard a lot more of some of the same bands. We saw the directors at the FMEA and FBA meeting. And here were they with their bands. And uh, by the time I was uh, even uh, classified as a senior, I knew more about Florida and Florida bands and education than I did about Michigan. And I rapidly made the choice that I was going to get a job and be a band director in Florida. And that's how I chose it. Well, that takes us to the next question. Where did you begin your teaching career? St. Cloud, Florida. Uh, I graduated in mid-year because Stetson was changing from the quarter system to the semester system. And uh, so by going uh, the last summer, three years plus a, a summer and another semester, I got out a semester early in mid-year. There were two job openings, uh, one in uh, uh, Milton Weary, a high school band director in, in Jacksonville, died. And the junior high band director, Kirby Smith, took that job. I was I applied for the, for the job at Kirby Smith Junior High and also applied at St. Cloud, where there was an opening and uh, in mid-year. And I took the St. Cloud job. I was a small town boy and I said, Jacksonville just kind of doesn't seem like my kind of place at this time in my life. 
So, uh, the first thing I, I wanted to do was find out what do, our, what do these students at St. Cloud know at the end of the first semester? Because I graduated on Saturday, moved on Sunday, and the second semester started on Monday. And uh, I wanted to talk to the principal, of course. I would had an interview and he told me certain things. But after I got there, I found out that the previous band director had scheduled a band concert on the following Sunday after I took the job on Monday. Uh, we dusted off those numbers a little bit and uh, we did the concert to a full house at the St. Cloud Tourist Club. A lot of gray-haired people and they had that place packed. There was a, an old man in his 80s came up to me after the concert and said, this was wonderful. I didn't even know the kids' names yet, hardly. Just a few of them. He said, I've made, I have constructed a lot of band shells in parks. The last one I did was in Haiti, but I've done a lot of them. And he said, I would like to build a band shell for these boys and girls in St. Cloud up here in the park. And he did with the help of uh, community groups. He so, did. So you, you established a band shell for the, for the St. Cloud High School band? He, yeah, he did. He, he, okay. We and did. I was right behind him. Okay, great. We had quite a group that did it. So, so as a band director, what were your challenges early on? Well, Besides I Besides hadn't given a concert a week after you've been there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the challenges there were, what's going to work? What can I do for the year? Uh, it was common knowledge around that they shouldn't go to district. The band director, Kissimmee, Bud Campbell, there were two high schools in the county, Osceola County. Bud Campbell says, I heard him. They, you can get them ready. They can do it. We did. We got ready and we went and the, the required number was uh, Silver Springs Overture by Reed Poole cool. and Reed, uh, from the University of Florida. And Reed just happened to be down in our county doing an in-service training and he came over and rehearsed that band on Silver Springs and the other numbers we had. And we went on and got a superior. Now this is unbelievable, you know. And uh, we did not, we did, we did not go to contest that, that year. This was called contest because we had a lot of building to do and a lot of getting acquainted. So what, what were the problems? Um, I hadn't done a marching band until the next fall. Uh, one of the big problems was that uh, we had uh, five trumpets in the band. Uh, one who could play first, uh, one who could play second, uh, two that could play third, and one uh, probably shouldn't have been there. So the biggest challenge on the homecoming parade was uh, that year, uh, to me, when the, the one lead trumpet who could play the part came up to me and said, Mr. DeYoung, I'm not going to be able to play in this homecoming parade. I said, why not? Well, my girlfriend is uh, in, the, uh, in the contest for the Beauty Queen or whatever the title was at the time, and I had promised her that I would drive the convertible for her. And I said, what are we going to do for first, first trumpet? I don't know, but I'm going to be driving the convertible. So Johnny DeYoung was the first trumpet player in that parade, <laughs> and I vowed I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to get a big enough band where we're not going to rest everything on one lead trumpet player. <laughs> so, so how long, how long before then you came to Polk County to Bartow? Because is that where you came after? Yes, I was at St. Cloud for uh, a total of that that half year. I finished and right. eight more. During that time, I met my wife to be. I was leading the singing and she was a new teacher at the school and she was in the front row singing very well. And so we got acquainted and uh, we've been together for 59 and a half years now. But uh, that, was, uh, that was eight and a half years we were together there and our two boys were born in St. Cloud. In 1960, I did summer school. I was hired here at Bartow in the spring of 1960. And I just thought uh, when I went to uh, John Ekman's Christmas concert two days ago in the high school auditorium, that was 53 years ago I attended a concert 
by the then band, where I wasn't band director, but I was about to come in as band director that spring in that high school auditorium. Same auditorium. Same auditorium. Yes, been improved, but same auditorium. And uh, so from there, uh, I began in 1960 in September. But what I was starting to say was, even though I'd been hired for Bartow in the spring of 1960, I taught an eight-week summer band program at St. Cloud by the request of the administration. And so I, uh, in September of 1960, I started a 24-year career at Bartow High School. I came into Bartow High School as the, as the junior high band director and high school band director and sixth grade band director and chorus director and general music at the seventh and eighth grade level. So you were the music faculty? Uh, for one year, and they hired another, another Earl King to be the band director at Bartow Junior High. Yeah, and we worked together for a number of years. And I continued on as high school director throughout the 24 years, and others have been junior high directors. In your career, uh, were there any pivotal moments or people that brought you your musical success? Oh yeah, of course. First, Louis Peterson, I mentioned, Bob McCamber, who steered me to Florida, Don Yaxley, who took me to FMEA and, and encouraged me uh, when it was time for me to decide whether to be a fisherman or a music man to get that degree and then make your dad hang out for two more years. See, and I made my mind up. These are pivotal, pi pivotal moments for sure. You know, and, and I know throughout your career, you, you know, as FBA president and then later on as FMEA president, uh, that was that was very ironic that one of the things that brought you here was going to the FMEA convention. As a college student. As a college student. Yes. Fa fast forward a number of years later, now you're in charge of that convention. Yeah. Putting that on. I thought that that's that's quite amazing. And one other factor here that is, would be of historical interest. I have met all, and I knew, all of the past presidents of the Florida Bandmaster Association except one. And oh, that goodness. one was the founder, Ed Chenette. And when I came to Bartow, right that first, first, that first half year, uh, Ed Chenette wa lived in Bartow. And I'd never met him. And I told our drum major, who, who I talked to, he was, he was a senior and knew Ed Chenette. I said, I want to go meet him and talk with him. I played his music when I was in right. high school in Michigan. He wrote marches that were widely used. And I was advised by the drum major, don't go because he's, he's uh, well, what we call dementia today. He was out of it. He wouldn't know you or wouldn't remember anything. So he's the only Florida Bandmaster president that I haven't really personally known. Every one of up until Every one of them. To right now. So. Yeah, and it was because I went to FMEA and FBA and this is the advice I would have to anybody in the state of Florida who wants to be a band director. You got to go. You got to be a part of Florida Bandmaster Association because students learn from each other and band directors and teachers learn from each other. And uh, that's very important. When I came to uh, Polk County uh, and met, well, I'd previously met him, uh, Tom Bishop and Bill Miller, and uh, Bud Ryan, at, who was at uh, Haines City, and, and others in Polk County, I thought, this is wonderful. Uh, it was only Bud Campbell and I in Osceola County, and we were pretty well isolated. Uh, isolated to the point, to regress a little bit here, that uh, when I was trying to get more students going at St. Cloud, uh, I couldn't get anybody from a music store anywhere to come and uh, talk to the parents about buying instruments. I had to get the representative from Lions Band Instrument Company who lived in Brandon but worked out of Chicago to get instruments to get them going. Now a few years later music stores were eager to come in and call on a weekly basis but that first couple of years uh, nobody wanted to go on the road. Well, that would be a, a challenge, you know. No, no one that was a challenge that today. Is, 
you know, where do we get the horns? And I would take instruments, student-owned instruments and school-owned instruments uh, to uh, Orlando a repair shop and stand there and l learn on a Saturday what he could tell me uh, so I didn't have to pay money for breaking loose a bits on sousaphones. Well, I know, I know from <laughs> personal experience your expertise in repairing instruments, and I, I've always, always wondered, where did he learn all this? Standing there watching the repairman do the job. And you would, you would have your repair kit that you carried with oh, you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, and, but today we just send them off. Right. Well, that's a great, that's a great uh, talent and abilities to have. Uh, what concepts did you instill in your students in order to achieve the high musical levels that your bands did? That's a harder one to, uh, to answer. Uh, the foundation and basics, you know, they've got to, they got to understand uh, scales and fingerings. And of course, starting out as beginners, and I, I, work, I, I work with setting up sixth grade beginners every year that I taught. I didn't teach them all, all through their first year, only uh, uh, several times I did. But I, I would meet with them and get them set up to get them going. Uh, but uh, to inspire the students, first you got to sell them on what you're trying to do. Right. They got to be with you. And uh, the importance of solos and ensembles, so you get the individual contact with them. Private lessons, if possible, although we had very few students with private lessons. Uh, I was able to work with some out of a study hall situation or something like that from time to time, but uh, and after school. But solos is when you have a chance to improve the individual. So you were really you you really pushed your kids to get involved in the the solo and ensemble. solos and ensembles. Uh, I learned that in Saint Cloud because when we were uh, when I was told uh, by some you shouldn't go. Administration thought I shouldn't go. But even the, solo and ensemble. Oh yeah, well, yeah, you had to do it all in one day. Right. You oh, either did or you did. One day. Oh, all in one day. Yeah, concert, sight reading, marching, solo. So and you ensemble. couldn't go to you couldn't go to one and no, not the other two. No, not at all. It was a one day deal. You leave at six, and you're lucky if you're home at ten thirty, and all all day. But anyway, um, where were we? What we trying to. How are they going to get there? I, I, I feel the importance of a, a balanced instrumentation. When I say right. balanced, I mean cover all the parts with the correct instrument. And, and, and to give a band experience, you got to be playing all the parts to come close to what the composer or arrangers uh, desire. Now you may pad the number on the parts with bigger bands. I was going to ask, what did you do if you couldn't do that? If it wasn't possible, what did you what were tricks were you, did you use to? Well, we came as close as we could that money would allow. Eventually, buying bassoon, which wasn't there, you know, eventually. Uh, I'm talking St. Cloud now. And also in Bartow. I'll throw this in. A lesser bassoon in 1973 on a school bid price was $373. <laughs> See how far $373 goes today. You buy a vocal with that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, this is an important question to to uh, to a lot of people. What do you do now to keep the uh, creative juices flowing in your retirement? I work with a Bartow Adult Concert Band, <laughs> and it's a it's a it takes well, a lot something of time. that you started. I might we add. started it in 1990 after uh, two or three years. So after starting, basically starting these programs or going into these programs and keeping them going so forth, you decide you didn't have enough, you wanted to start another band. Well, um, I retired and uh, I took some college courses in finances and investing, at, uh, which seemed like a good idea at South Florida. And uh, I did some private teaching and quite a bit of private teaching, uh, four days a week. And during that time, people would, in different towns, I was asked by the one, the band director in uh, Arcadia and in Wachula if I'd come down and work private lessons, which I did. 
uh, before I started teaching private lessons in Bartow. And, uh, but uh, people, former students and, and people around town, adults, said, why don't you get an adult band going? I turned it down for a couple of years. But in 1990, I thought, they kept asking, and I thought, well, I know enough people around the county, surely, not just Bartow, but all over the county, you know, musicians that might be interested in that. And so we started it in, in, uh, in October of 1990, and our general plan, it, the first few years were rocky, because we didn't know just what we were doing along uh, this line, for sure. Uh, like we uh, we work we rehearse for about five weeks, and I'd say, well, we we can put this concert on. How many can be here for uh, a week from Sunday? Oh, I can't do that. We got this. We got that. Finally, we decided that if we're going to make this thing go, we're going to have rehearsals at a certain time, <laughs> and we're going to have a schedule of concerts. And those that can make the schedule, we're going to do it. If you can't make the schedule, that's the way it is. And we keep going, and some that wanted to do that would change their other obligations over a two or three year period to where they could free up Monday nights if they really wanted to do it. And so uh, this has been a joy to me. Um, I would throw in another thing on this topic. Uh, the I belong to the Association of Concert Bands since 1992. They have a, an annual uh, convention. Now that's mostly community and all community service bands. Service bands, yeah, circuits bands, that level community band type of thing. We've learned a lot from those conventions. We haven't gone to all of them, but we've gone all over the country too. Right. Them. So uh, how many they, people usually attend your concerts with the adult band? Our concerts are right now uh, were for several years. Let me answer it this way. When we first started, we had about 125, uh, 175 interested people out in the park on a flat stage. Okay. And as we, we went inside eventually on a couple of years, after a couple of years, uh, to the high school auditorium, and we had 400, and we filled up every seat in the high school auditorium with a Christmas concert. So then we, we went to the Civic Center, and uh, that still, it had, maybe we got up to 300, maybe, maybe 400 in the first few years. And, but there came a time we couldn't go beyond that. And the Lakeland Concert Band, which has got a many year head start on us, uh, was filling up Yuki Theater with 2,100 seats. And uh, some said, how can we get more? So my wife and I did this. We started taking flyers all over, uh, retirement communities and, and bulletin boards where we could find them all over Polk County and we'd put about 500 miles on the car before every concert and put up the program for every concert and we got up to, to answer your question 1142 the most ever we had in the Civic Center uh, that ex that was at that time the fire marshal said 1200 the fire marshal later changed it down to 800. They didn't want that many in there. But we get now, uh, at the most recent concert, uh, uh, 10 days ago, was uh, where Dave Fultz conducted, was 942 people in the hall, including 68 in the band. So uh, generally, we're somewhere between 750 and 950 in an audience for the last few years. We don't go around, we go around once, once putting up a yearly uh, schedule of our concerts. We don't go around putting the program like we did for two years we did that. For 14 concerts, we went around uh, before every concert. They, okay. They've got the people. That's a way to get the people. Right. Well, we're just about out of time here. Do you have one short story that would demonstrate your satisfaction in choosing the life of a band director? Well. A lot of people in this world uh, have jobs where they look at a white wall and they operate a lathe and they turn out widgets eight hours a day. To me, that's got to be depressing. I know what it was like to be a commercial fisherman. Uh, I loved it. We had a ball doing that. 
It was wonderful. However, that business disappeared. I make the right. I made the right choice there. By the way, that business. You got to be an American Indian to fish commercially on the Great Lakes today. Uh, that's still permitted. Uh, uh, the Association of Concert Bands has a bulletin that they send out, and there was an article in there about a band director who was 90 years old, and he had started a band uh, many years ago, a community band. And my first reaction was, upon reading that just a few years ago, I don't think I want to do that when I'm 90. And then I thought, maybe that's how he got to be 90. <laughs> so. I still think uh, I want to keep going because it's fun. And I asked the players, especially when we get a new one for the first time in, I said, did you have fun? Yeah, this is great. And uh, that's why they're there. They're not there for any reason uh, for this. We have 70 on the books right now with, with actually eight more that are uh, either sick or traveling or not available at this particular time. But we've got 70 listed on, on, the, on our folio list for the next coming concert, January 19th. Well, thanks for your, your time and your wisdom and your service to the Florida Bandmasters Association and Florida Music Educators Association. John, we really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you.